Is the ancient Petrolona skull from Greece the long-sought, missing link between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals? When searching for the truth regarding human evolution, we have been constructing small parts of a large puzzle on this channel. The identification of early Homo sapiens fossils is one of the most important components of this puzzle. The Petrolona skull of Greece, which has been dated to 350,000 years ago, is one such fossil that is sometimes ignored. When this skull was analyzed in the 1970s, it was determined to be an early Homo sapiens specimen, very similar to the Jebel Erhoud skull from Morocco, which dates back 330,000 years. The significance of this skull and the findings, however, has been buried because it contradicts the out-of-Africa concept. The out-of-Africa theory proposes that early Homo sapiens evolved in Africa, with the three subspecies, Neanderthals, Denisovans, and Sapiens, appearing no later than 500,000 years ago. Then, shortly after separating from Sapiens, Neanderthals and Denisovans left Africa, leaving no fossil traces or genetic imprint. In actuality, African paleontology in terms of Homo sapiens genesis and evolution lags much behind that of Eurasia. Evidence suggests that Neanderthals and Sapiens interbred around 220,000 years ago in Europe, and 130,000 years ago in Eurasia, both of which pose challenges to the out-of-Africa theory. For a long time, it was assumed that our species descended from a small, diversified group living in a remote part of Africa. Evidence contradicting this belief first surfaced over two decades ago, but it has only recently gained widespread acceptance. To be honest, the emergence of a pure human form on one continent and its expansion to replace all others has serious consequences. It is known as colonialism in Europe and manifest destiny in the United States. It is widely assumed that the first Homo sapiens individuals lived in Africa, and that Homo sapiens sapiens evolved on the same continent. Only the precise timing of our subspecies origin, according to the majority of experts, needs to be determined. This assumption may be incorrect though, because highly compelling new evidence reveals that the Homo sapiens sapiens subspecies likely originated in Eurasia. In point of fact, the geographic confinement of Neanderthals to Eurasia, as well as genetic exchanges between Neanderthals and sapiens, provide crucial paleontological and molecular evidence consistent with the genesis and continuous presence of Homo sapiens sapiens in Eurasia. In terms of paleontology and archaeology associated with Homo sapiens evolution, the Eurasian advances in this field over the last 30 years are of enormous importance. The early phases of the evolution were investigated in the study that related the morphology of Homo sapiens and Homo erectus to a continuous Homo sapiens admixing in Asia, including gene flow between Eastern and Western Asia. According to an report, titled The Relevance of the Hominid Skull from Petrolona, Greece, Radiographs provide vital information on the evolutionary history of features such as the frontal sinus. Pneumatization is the hollowing of the brow ridges, and only two skulls have this unique feature. Previous evolutionary schemes have argued for a steady rise in frontal pneumatization in the evolution of Homo sapiens, which allowed for growth of the frontal cortex. One of the most remarkable features of the lateral view of the cranium is the protruding supraorbital torus, aka the brow ridge. Meanwhile, the frontal sinus occupies the entire breadth of the supraorbital torus, except for the parts lateral to the orbits, and although the medial height of the sinus is comparable to that of the archaic Homo sapiens cranium from Broken Hill in Zambia, known as Carbwe, the total area pneumatized is much greater in the Petrolona specimen. This region of the brain is important for processes that make us distinctly Homo sapien such as communication, emotion and planning with the sinuses now giving another means for scientists to infer the development of this part of the brain. The study discovered that species such as Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens have varied ranges of sinus size, which experts say could be linked to evolutionary restrictions created by the development of features such as larger brains. However, two crania, Petrolina and Carbwe, which many believe depict archaic Homo sapiens, stand out as extremely different from the others. Their sinuses are substantially bigger than their relatives and we don't know why. It could suggest that they're a specialized group. 
They have very large forehead ridges which have been hypothesized as having a role in social signaling, and large sinuses would lessen the weight of these. The research also uncovers fresh information about our own evolution, demonstrating linkages between these sinuses and the size of the frontal lobe in Homo erectus and later. The size of the sinuses is compatible with the development of a short extension of one of the brain's lobes relative to the other, a trait shared by most humans and may be connected with the dominant hand. According to another study titled, Nasopharyngeal Morphology Contributes to Understanding the Muddle in the Middle of the Pleistocene Hominin Fossil Record, Homo erectus had a tall, narrow nasopharyngeal shape, a robust, ancestral morphology, while Carbway and Petrolona plotted along the same lineage as Homo sapiens, as shown in this graph. Another topic is the nature and age of the last common ancestor of the sapiens and Neanderthalensis lineages. The similarities in shape between the Carbway and Petrolona crania suggest the existence of a widespread Middle Pleistocene population. Furthermore, based on DNA evidence, this species may represent the most likely last common ancestor for the Neanderthalensis and Sapiens lineages, with their common origin estimated to be around 400,000 years ago. Furthermore, a study that used geometric morphometrics of different crania to virtually reconstruct the last common ancestor of Neanderthals, and modern humans discovered that an Afro-European human species came the closest to the hypothetically reconstructed last common ancestor, with the added suggestion that the last common ancestor most likely lived in Africa. New genomic data complicate the reconstruction of the nature and date of Neanderthals and modern humans' last common ancestor. As previously stated, DNA reveals that the last common ancestor lived around 400,000 years ago. The apparent Neanderthal morphological and genetic similarities of the Sima remains, which date back at least 400,000 years, show that an evolutionary divergence occurred far earlier. Furthermore, using the most recent autosomal human mutation rate estimates, the divergence date of the Neanderthalensis and Sapiens lineages can be placed earlier, between 550,000 and 765,000 years ago which is consistent with only the oldest suggested examples of Heidelbergensis potentially representing the last common ancestor. The physical traits of the Petrolona skull suggest that it belonged to a human transitioning from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens. It is now thought to be 300,000 years old, following extensive investigation and debate. The skull was an integral component of the puzzle that was human evolution. The cave in which it was found IIS now known as the Parthenon of Paleontology, and it has been researched by some of the world's top paleoanthropologists. Although the jaw is lacking, the cranium is nearly complete and similar to carbway specimens. All of these combine basic qualities, prominent brow ridges, a ridge down the back of the skull, and thick brain case bones, with later Homo species modern characteristics, including a somewhat larger brain, such as Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, and modern humans, Homo sapiens. The evidence is mounting that the skull unearthed in the Petrolona cave is the most complete middle Pleistocene cranium ever discovered, providing critical morphological, metrical, and radiographic information on the possible evolutionary transition from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens. Thus, the Petrolona fossil should be assigned to archaic Homo sapiens rather than Homo heidelbergensis or a Homo neanderthalensis, just as the Jebel Erhoud skull of Morocco is considered early Homo sapiens. As state, extensive research on the morphology of the skull reveals that it is 300,000 to 400,000 years old. This is especially significant for the study of human evolution as well as its existence on the European continent. Today, some researchers who have studied the Petrolona remains believe that the cranium of Petrolona belongs to an archaic hominid, distinct from Homo erectus, classic Neanderthals, and anatomically modern humans, yet exhibiting traits of all of those species. The out-of-Africa idea of human evolution is directly contradicted by a 300,000-year-old archaic Homo sapiens cranium located in southeastern Europe. Further investigations in the Petrolona cave include exceptional discoveries such as fossilized bits of wood, an oak leaf, animal hair, and coprolites, which enabled reliable dating, as well as the practically continuous presence of stone and bone tools from the cave's layers of silt. The form of the skull is so confusing that some paleontologists believe it indicates a transitional condition between Homo neanderthalensis and its more basic progenitor. 
the Petrolona man, as paleontologists dubbed the skull, shares many similarities with other Neanderthal fossils, but it also has some very rudimentary traits. The skull was initially identified as Homo neanderthalensis, but was later reclassified as Homo erectus. Today, however, most scholars agree that it corresponds to the Homo rhodesiensis species of fossils discovered in Africa. Greece, given its location and temperature, should be brimming with hominid bones and stone implements. Its location made it the ideal entrance to Europe for the first hominids to leave Africa, and even during dry and cold seasons that rendered most of the rest of the world unusable, Greece remained comfortable. However, the country's archaeological record from 1.8 million to 125,000 years ago, known as the early to middle Pleistocene, is lacking. One possible explanation for the scarcity of finds is that hominids never fully established themselves in the area. There was nothing to leave behind if they didn't reside there. They took into account the shifting sea level throughout time. During cold periods, more water is trapped in the world's polar ice sheets and glacier, and sea level rises, exposing areas of the sea floor. When the weather warms up again, the ice melts and the sea level rises. Much of the Aegean Sea east of Greece was dry land during the early and middle Pleistocene. In fact, the whole area exposed at the time equaled the area of the Greek peninsula today, more than 50,000 square miles. If all dry land was a suitable living place for hominids, the researchers estimate that half of the potential archaeological record is now drowned beneath the Aegean. Back on dry land, a variety of climatic and geologic conditions influenced the possibility of preserving bones and artifacts. Water was a major contributor, rivers and streams degraded the landscape, sweeping sediments and artifacts away and stacking them up elsewhere. Climate change caused repeated catastrophic flooding in the early and middle Pleistocene, according to the researchers, with archaeological assemblages subjected to disturbance, reworking, or entire destruction every few thousands, hundreds, or even tens of years. Tectonic activity, or movement inside the Earth's crust and mantle that affects topography, exacerbated the situation. Greece is a tectonically active location, and the crust was stretching during the early and middle Pleistocene. The stretching shifted direction at one point, elevating blocks of dirt and exposing bones and artifacts to harmful erosion for thousands of years. In the meantime, several blocks were buried to protect antiquities. Such basins are likely to contain the majority of possible archaeological sites today. Because there was so much more land exposed in the past, forming a natural land bridge with Turkey, hominids dispersing from North Africa through the Sinai Peninsula, and the Middle East could easily have followed the southern coast of Turkey into coastal Greece, and then on to Italy and the rest of Europe. Furthermore, geological evidence implies that the environment would have contained several lakes, lagoons, marshes, and streams rich in important plant and animal resources. Why wouldn't Homo sapiens want to live there? 